Good morning. Boy, some of you are really out of place. I see some of you that sit over here or way over here, and that's a good thing. I'm glad to see that this morning. And then we have some that don't want to sit down, so that's our, that's, that, I won't mention Eileen's name. Oh, hi, Eileen. How are you doing? <laughs> no, it's okay. I can go now. I, I'm glad I have your permission. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I hope you are too. We serve in a pretty amazing God, don't we? We serve an amazing God, and you know, m- many of you, uh, like me, probably over the last several weeks, months, have been watching the news, and you see there's no peace in our country. There's no peace. It's not anything new. We have pathetic leadership. There's no black and white, or there's no gray areas here. We have pathetic leadership in this country. And I know that someday there's no, there may be no peace in this country, There may be no peace in this world, but I know someday the Prince of Peace is coming. He's coming. And I want to challenge you this morning. I pray pray this morning that God's Word challenges you this morning, like it challenges me. Because I want to ask you a question before we get started. If Christ were to return right now, because the Bible says that we don't know the time of His his coming. We We don't know the time of the rapture of the church. We don't know that. It's imminent can happen at any time. I could be standing here holding my Bible and and be raptured out of here. But I want to ask you this. If Christ were to return right now, would you be ready to go? I'm not talking emotionally. I'm not talking physically. I'm not talking mentally. I'm talking spiritually. Are you ready to go? And if Christ were to come back today, Would you be ready in such a way with your life, with the way you're living your Christian life, that you could say, I I know when I stand before him, he'll be well pleased with me. Will Christ be well pleased with the way you live your Christian life? It's time for Christians to stand apart. The, The Bible tells us, Jesus says, be holy, for I am holy. He doesn't say be perfect, I'm perfect. He says, be holy. We're to, we're to be set apart. You and I are to look different. Do you agree that we're to look different? Absolutely we're to look different. But you know what's happening today? Christians are saying, yes, I'm Christian. I'm Christian. With their mouth. But they're not living it with their life. They're practicing atheists with their life. And I wonder... And I don't want to sound judgmental. If you take this as judgmental, I'm sorry. But I wonder when that time comes, when the rapture of the church comes, I wonder how many people that are inside the church will be shocked if they're left behind. I want to challenge you this morning. As the scriptures have challenged me, we're looking at Matthew chapter 13, which is a very difficult passage of scripture. It talks about the second coming of Christ. Jesus' disciples are sitting on the Mount of Olives. James, Peter, and John, and Andrew's in there. And they ask him, Master, Teacher, when will be the signs of these things? Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew's gospel says, when will be the signs of the end of the age? Or your second coming? And Jesus gives them a picture. Of the rapture of the church, you have, you and I have no idea. You have no idea when it will come. There have been men that have set dates for, for the second coming of Christ all throughout our history, only to find out that, hey, the Bible's correct again, in saying that no man knows the hour or the day. We don't know when, but Christ is coming. And Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 13, just like he told his disciples, that we are to be ready. And that we are to watch. We are to be ready. He says, behold. 
We're to be on guard for that day. Are you on guard for that day? Are you watching for that day? Or are you praying for that day, as the Bible share, shares us? You and I, as Christians, as born-again believers in Christ, should be looking for the second coming of Christ. We should be looking for the rapture of the church. The second part of that second coming, we will be behind him, coming in the clouds. Are you ready? Are you really ready for that time? Is your life lived in such a way that when Christ comes, you're ready to go? Jesus told his disciples what those days would look like when he comes back. He told his disciples what it would look like prior to him coming back. And several weeks ago, we began a message entitled, I am coming, ready or not. Jesus is coming, whether you are ready or whether you are not ready. And it is imperative that you be ready. Somebody said to me the other night, they listened to the message online, and they said, why are you preaching about the second coming of Christ. I said, my gosh, you're kidding me, right? That's the Christian hope. That's the Christian hope. What are you looking forward to? Are you looking forward to spending eternity with Christ? The Bible teaches it. Somebody told me that their church doesn't preach out of the book of Revelation because it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with the church. It has everything to do with the church. Well, we looked at several weeks ago, we looked at the signs of Jesus' coming. Jesus' disciples asked him specifically, when, when are the signs of the end of the age? When, when is this time? And we looked at the signs of his coming, and we looked at the fact that they're clear signs. We already looked at that. They're clear signs. In fact, if you look in, in, uh, in uh, Mark chapter uh, 13 and just look at verse 6, it says, And many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and, and shall deceive many. Look, there's deception. This is a sign. And, and all, most of the things that, that, that are mentioned, that Jesus mentioned to his disciples, are going to take place during the tribulation. Do you believe that what we see in the world today is foreshadowing of things to come? That's right. Amen. Foreshadowing of things to come. You and I have been scheduled, this generation has been scheduled by Almighty God to see things that our generations, that our parents have never seen, that our grandparents have never seen. Go ask an 80 or a 90 year old person that's still alive if there's ever been a time in their history of living quite like today and they'll tell you no. We have been scheduled for this time. He says there's clear signs. There's going to be deception. And remember a lot of this, if you think there's deception today, wait till the tribulation period comes. Wait till the tribulation period. If you're not a Christian here, you'll wait for that period because you're going to enter into it. And by the way, maybe you're here this morning, you say, I'm not a pre-tribber. I'm not a pre-tribulation. I, I don't believe that the church is going to be taken out before the, the tribulation. If you're not a pre-tribber today, at the, at the rapture of the church, you will be. There's clear signs. Verse 7 says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. When we think of wars and rumors of wars, we think about the peace in the, the lack of peace in the Middle East. We think of the Korean War, World War I, World War II, uh, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, uh, Vietnam, all these wars. But what about what took place in, in Ferguson? What about the things that took place in Baltimore? Would you classify those as wars? I do. There's such civil unrest in our country. 
We live in an entitlement society. Clear signs. Verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles, and troubles, Baltimore. And these things are the beginning of sorrows. Now you think it's bad now. Enter into the tribulation period. Clear signs. Verse 9. Take heed. Be on guard. For yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues, and you shall be beaten, and you shall uh, be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them. There's going to be persecution. And if you think there's persecution today, wait till the tribulation period. And verse 14. And this is where I want to begin today. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not to be, Luke's gospel says the holy place. He says, let him that readeth understand and let them that be in Judea flee unto the mountains. They're going to flee to Petra. 1,000 Jews every day, 365 days a year, visit Petra. Petra. A place for the Jews to flee. So they're, they're clear signs. They're terminal signs. And you know what? They're confirmed signs. We looked at that. The Bible confirms its, its own testimony. Thy word is truth. You shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. The Bible is an eternal book. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will what? Thank you. Never pass away. Jesus says... But when you shall see, in verse 14, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, or standing in the holy place, let him that readeth understand, and let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Somebody says, is the Antichrist, do you believe the Antichrist is alive today? I have no idea. Because I'm looking forward to the rapture, I'd like to think he is. I would like to think that he's out there somewhere. Folks, he's going to be a great orator. He's going to be a man of political power, of great influence. He's going to be a smooth talker. Because at the rapture of the church, there's going to be utter chaos across this land. Not just America, but the entire world. And this man will rise up. And he will speak away much of what's happening. He will speak it away. He's a great orator. Jesus said this, as I think about this, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, I come unto my own and they receive me not. He said, but there's going to be one that comes after me whom you will receive. And he's talking about the Antichrist. Doesn't that break your heart? The Christ that went to the cross. The Christ that took the scourging for the sins of the world. The Christ that, that came into uh, this world through the form of a baby. Took all the ridicule. Turned his cheek one side to the other as he was slapped and spit upon. As he had his beard plucked out. As he was mocked and ridiculed. I come into the world, he says, and you will not receive me. And there will be one that comes after me whom you will receive. And that's the Antichrist. That's the instead of Christ. That's sad. He comes, the Antichrist, the instead of Christ, he comes in a way that's more appealing to people's eyes, to their intellect. He comes in political form. Jesus comes as a humbly servant. He, the, the Antichrist will come in power and, and might. And Jesus lowly. Riding on a donkey. Is the Antichrist alive today? I have no idea. I like to believe that he is. And he tells them, there in verse 14, it's read into the scriptures. If you understand anything about the second coming, the tribulation of the, of the church, or the tribulation period, I'm sorry, the rapture of the church is gone. That begins a seven-year period. 
And the Antichrist is going to, to establish a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. He's going to establish a peace treaty. Three and a half years into the peace treaty is where we're at in verse 14. He breaks it. He stands up in the holy place. He stands up in the place where he should not. And he says, I am God. And then let all those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let all those in Judea flee to the mountains. The first three and a half years of the tribulation, not a picnic. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse. One quarter, and I know I've shared this with you, one quarter of the world's population in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. One quarter of the world's population gone. Dead. Imagine, I think I told you this, imagine driving through South America, all through South America. Imagine driving through all of Central America. Imagine driving through Mexico and the United States and then all through Canada and all parts of Western Europe and not one person. Gone. The first three and a half years, no picnic. The second three and a half years is very troubling. Two weeks ago, we looked at the second point in this message, which was the secrecy or the stealth of his coming. And that's just very simply put, and I just want to jump over to the verse, to verse 32, where he says this, But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Even Jesus, in his incarnation at this time, as he spoke to his disciples, did not know. I believe he knows today. So it's a hidden time. Don't try to say, I know when Christ is coming. Oh, I believe it's soon, but I'm not going to put a date on it. It's a hidden time, and it's also a heavenly time. It's a time that's created in heaven, not here on earth. In verse 15 it says, And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither, there, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe unto them that are with child, mothers who are nursing, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight, your escape, your way out, be not in the winter. Matthew's gospel says we're on the Sabbath day. And here's the reason. Verse 19, for in those days <clears throat> shall be affliction. And remember, I said, if you think the Christians are persecuted today, wait till the rapture of the church. Or wait till the church is out of here. Wait till the tribulation. And here's why. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the world of the creation of God... Created unto this time. Jesus is telling his disciples, there has never been any persecution. There has never been any affliction. There has never been a time since the creation up until this point in time. And then he says, neither shall be. Neither shall there be. This is the worst ever in history. Look back in Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 12. And look at verse 1. Look how Daniel describes it in his prophecy. Jan Daniel 12, 1, he says, And at that time shall Michael, it, it's, it's uh, Michael stand up. There's only one Michael, the archangel. Just one. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time your people, thy people, shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Daniel's prophecy tells us the very same thing that Jesus Christ, Quotes from here, Jesus tells his disciples that there will never be a time like this in the history. Ever since there's been a nation. In verse 20 he says, And except that the Lord had shortened those days, 
No flesh should be saved, but the elect's sake. We're going to read more about the elect as we go through this. Whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Amen. Verse 21 says, And then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, there's more deception, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, even if it were possible, but it's not possible, even the elect. Look at Revelation chapter 16. Look at Revelation 16 says about the deception. Revelation 16 and verse 13 to 16. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, not frogs, but like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils. What are they doing? They're working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Folks, there's going to be great deception in those days. There's going to be great signs and great miracles performed, but it's satanic to bring about deception. Listen to me, if you're not ready spiritually for the rapture of the church, you better get ready. Right now, you better get ready because you do not want to enter this period. You having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, you hear it in this church. You having heard the gospel of Christ and openly reject the gospel of Christ, if you enter into this period, you have no chance. Verse 23, look what he says. But take ye heed. Look, he's writing, he's telling his disciples this, but he's writing this to you and I. Take ye heed, behold, consider, I have foretold you all things. I have not kept one thing back from you. I have warned you. I have told you. I have not withheld any counsel from you. Now look here in verse 24. Jesus, I, be, I believe this is, I believe, and I go back to verse 4 of this chapter because I believe right here he's answering their specific questions. Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age? When is the sign of the end of times? And he says here in verse 24, he says, But in those days, the days of the tribulation, after what? After that what? tribulation after that seven year hell on earth period and that's minimally describing it after that seven year period look here the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light listen to me there will not be any light left on this earth only the light of the glory of God that comes in the clouds there is no light left. The moon shall not give her light. Remember, the sun gets its light from, or the moon gets its light from the sun, doesn't it? That's right. The sun shall be darkened, no light. And the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall. He says, this is how you can tell I'm coming. So Jesus doesn't give us a specific day. You and I are going to be, again, in the mezzanine section. Those of us that are Christians won't be here during this period of time. We'll be in heaven. But it says here, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. I don't know fully what that means. I don't know what that looks like. But I don't like the sound of it. And then... I have it underlined in my Bible, verse 26. And then, after you see these things, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man 
coming in the clouds with great power and great glory. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and look at verse 7 and look at how John describes this in Revelation 1 7. Behold, behold, he cometh with clouds. <laughs> I love that. Do you know who's coming with him? The, the whole church is coming with him. I, I, I envisioned this the other day. I was thinking, man, if he's coming on a white horse, or he's coming on a cloud, am I going to be riding a horse? Am I going to be coming on a horse? And, and I could, I mean, I don't ride a horse very well. I'll be all over the place in the back, falling all over the place. But you know what? I believe we'll all be perfect riders if they come on white horses. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, he says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. See, the rapture of the church, not every eye, and nobody's going to see him. The rapture of the church goes, boom, you're out of here. You don't see him. If you see him on this day, if you see him on this day and you are not a believer, you're in trouble. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So you don't have to listen to some people conjuring up some formula as to when Christ is going to return, when he's coming to put his foot on. On this earth. That's what uh, Revelation 1 7 is talking about. This is what uh, Mark chapter 13, verse, verse 24, 25, and 26 are talking about when he comes to put his foot on this earth. We don't even know when that time will be, but he gives us signs and he tells them what it's going to look like just before that happens. And in verse 27, he says, And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect. I believe, uh, some people say, well, this is just the Jews. I believe this is everybody that has been born again, Jews and Gentiles, at this period of time. From the four winds of the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. And, and you can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and Isaiah chapter 11. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 5. You can read about it in Zechariah chapter 2. It's all throughout the Old Testament. And he says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth her leaves. You know that summer is near. Jesus always uses, in the Old Testament, he used Israel as an example. He used an illustration to, to describe Israel. He compared Israel to the fig tree. In fact, Jesus said that cursed is the fig tree when he cursed Israel. But it says, now learn a parable of the fig tree when a branch is yet tender and puts forth its leaves... You know that summer is near. There's a lot of debate over what this means. Could it mean that when, when Israel became a nation back in 1948 again, reestablished, that she was beginning to put forth her leaves? Could be. Does it mean that when Israel became, uh, when Israel defeated her six Arab nations in the, in the six days of war back in 1967, was that when Israel began to put forth its leaves? I don't know. I don't know that. No scholars know. But I know one who does. I know one who does. When Israel, or the fig tree, when her branch is yet tender and puts forth her leaves, you know that summer is near. When you look outside the windows and you see the budding trees and the beautiful flowers... You know that spring is here and summer's coming, don't you? And so you, as a house owner, you as a gardener, don't you prepare for that time of season? When you see these things, when you see the fig tree, when you see Israel start to bud, when you see Israel start to bloom, when you see Israel start to blossom again, know that summer is near. Know that it's near. There is no time in history, history, period, where Jews are going back to Israel like they are today. 
We are scheduled for this time. You and I are scheduled to see this time. The Jews are flooding back home to Israel. Now there is not millions and millions of people in a line waiting to get across the border. But they're going home, people. They're going home, just as Jesus said, just as the the Old Testament prophets testified. They're going home. Israel's government is offering them jobs, is offering them land, offering to build them homes, and they're going back. The nation of Israel is growing. And you know what God says about the nation of Israel. They will not be destroyed. Verse 29 says, So ye, now look here, I love this. So ye, so you, in like manner, look at what I just said, begin to learn a parable of the fig tree, that when the branch is tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you, in like manner, you in the same way, when you shall see these when you shall see these things come to pass know that it is nigh even at the doors luke's gospel says when you shall see all these things come to pass in fact i want you to look over in luke chapter 21 and i want you to look at two verses luke 21 And I want you to look at verse 28. Maybe it's Matthew's gospel. I got Luke and gas. But but stay in Luke. Stay in Luke. In verse 28, he says, Jesus says, And when these things, look here, begin, begin, if you write in your Bibles, underline, begin to come to pass, then look up. And lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The word redemption, in its original form, is always talking about these bodies. It's talking about the rapture of the church, us being taken out. So when you you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, your redemption draweth draweth nigh we are a redeemed people living in an unredeemed body on this day we will be completely redeemed now i want you to skip down to verse 31 jesus says so likewise you when you see these things now look come to pass up in verse 28 it says when you see these things begin to come to pass. That's in the very beginning stages. He, down 31, he says, so likewise, when you see these things come to pass, those are two different times. He says, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Those are two different times. Verse 28 says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, Christians, look up because your redemption, your physical body is going to be redeemed. It's going to be taken out of here, raptured out of here. Verse 31, so likewise, when you see these things come to fulfillment, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God, that's different is nigh at hand. Two different times. Two different, two, different, two different specified times right there in just three verses that Jesus talks about. And he says, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. There's argument over that. What is he talking about? Well, obviously, he wasn't telling, it, wasn't, it didn't apply to, to James, uh, Peter, and John, and Andrew because they're dead. They're dead. No debate. The word generation means genos. It means race. Some say, well, this is the Jewish race. I believe simply, 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 that it means that the generation that is alive during these times will not pass away, will not be wiped out until these things come to fulfillment. Heaven and earth shall pass away, 
but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. Don't try to guess. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. This brings us to our third point. The, message, the third part of our message that we didn't talk about yet at all. From verse 33 to verse 37. We looked at the, the signs of His coming. We looked at the stealth or the secrecy of His coming. And now we're looking at the seriousness of His coming. Verse 33 to 37 says, Take ye heed, watch and pray. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. Matthew says, as in the days of Noah. For as the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. In this parable, Jesus is the man who took a far journey. In fact, he's so far, he's sitting at the right hand of his father right now. And he left his house, this earth, and he gave authority to his servants, that's you and I. And to every man his work, that's you and I. And commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes. You don't know when Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father, you do not know when he's coming back. At evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming, coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. That includes us. Watch. Watch. I tell you these things ahead of time so that you can be ready. The seriousness of his coming. You and I are called to watch. We are called to watch. The word watch appears three times or four times in this whole text. Jesus wants his people. He, wants, he wanted uh, uh, John and, and Peter and James and Andrew. He wanted them to watch. He wants you and I to watch. He wants us to be on alert. Not sitting hiding behind a pew, but he wants us to be on alert. He wants us to be on guard. We're to live every moment in anticipation for his return. Do you long for that and look for that? We're called to watch. It means to keep awake, to be attentive, to be ready. And it has the idea of a watchman who dares not fall asleep while he's on duty. He keeps his eyes open. He keeps his ears open. You and I should spend time watching. We should spend time watching. Christ is coming and we need to be on alert. But I want you to know we have an enemy. The enemy Satan, what he wants to do is he wants to infiltrate our churches today. And he's done a pretty good job at it. The churches today look a lot like the world. I shared with you this morning, before we got into the message, we're to be holy because he's holy. We are to look different. It's time for Christians to start putting their actions into, start putting their words into actions. We are to look different than that world. We're not to despise the world. We're not to hate the world. But our lives are to be such a reflection of Jesus Christ that that world says, I want what you have. We've muddied the waters. We've muddied the waters today, so much so that when you go outside into the world or you come into the church, you can't tell where you're at. And God doesn't author confusion. Satan has done a great job of infiltrating us, church, our churches today and, listen, and turning us from the old paths. Turning us from the old paths. The world is seeking and it wants to grab our attention and captivate us with its treasures. Turning us from the old paths. Look, look at Isaiah. I want you to turn back to this wonderful prophet's writing here. In Isaiah chapter 30, I want you to look at verse 8 to 11. Look, I want you to know that there's, uh, nothing changes under the sun. When Isaiah wrote this to the nation of Israel and wrote it to us, 
Look at the people, look at the things that were going on when he wrote this. In Isaiah chapter 30, look at verse 8 and look at to, through verse 11. It says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, and for how long, and forever and ever, for you and I. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, true things, the truth of God's word. We don't want to hear right things. We don't want to hear the truth. Speak to us, speak unto us smooth things, flatter us. Prophesy deceits. And verse 11 says, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. I tell you what, I like old Tea Party Ted. And I can tell you this this sounds like America. Get the Holy One of Israel out of our way. We don't want him. We don't want him. Speak to us smooth things, flatter us, tickle our ears. We don't want to hear the truth because you know the truth may hurt. How many of you does the truth step on your toes? A couple of you, that's good. Steps on mine all the time. The truth is the fact that Jesus is coming back. You and I are called to watch. His people need to be awake. We need to be awake. We need to be watching. Just like verse 36 says, lest coming suddenly he find you asleep. And when he comes, I don't want to be found asleep. We're also commanded to pray. Verse 33 tells us to pray. Take ye heed, watch and pray. Watch and pray. One of the best ways for you and I to stay awake in this world and in these dark days is to stay in close contact with headquarters. The more time you and I spend with him in prayer, the more alert we are spiritually. And not only are we called to watch, you and I are challenged and called to work. We're called to work. You say, well, I do have a job. Yep, you have a job. But are you doing Jesus' job? Look at verse 34. It says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded a porter to watch. Jesus describes himself as the house owner here in verse 34 who leaves his business in the hands of his servants. That's you and I. And this man assigns each of his servants a specific task and then he takes his journey. And the servants do not know when he's coming back. So they're encouraged to work diligently so that they will not be found shirking their duties whenever he returns. And that's why I ask you this morning, if Jesus would come back, would you feel confident that it's okay, that I'm going to go before him now? When Christ saved us, he saved us to work for him. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 10. You know this, per- this passage. But when he saved us, he told us that we are to work for him. In verse 10, this verse often gets left out of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but it should be concluded together with it. It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're to work for Him, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So when He saved us, He gave each and one of us a specific assignment. In other words, Jesus gave you a job to do, and He gave me a job to do. And our duty to him is to faithfully do these things until he comes back for us. And I think in light of that, this morning, we need to ask ourselves a couple questions. Do you know what God wants you to do? Do you know what God wants you to do? Do you know what he has for you to do in this life? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. Second question is, are you doing what he wants you to do? Are you doing it? Are you saying, no, I, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I don't think God would want me to do that. 
Are you being a good example? Are you being a good example to your kids? Are you being a good example to your friends? Are you being a Christ-like example to your friends? Are you being an example in your home, to your wife, to your husband? Are you being a Christ-like example? When people look at you, do they say, man, she looks different. Man, he looks different. Or when they look at you, when they look at me, do they say, ha, he just, he just one of us, you know? Third question you need to ask yourself, are you willing to ask him if you don't know what your job is? There is so much to be done while we wait on Christ's return. And his will is that we serve him faithfully and diligently until he comes for us, either in the death of this life or in the rapture. And you know what he says there in the last verse of this scripture? I love it. Yeah, we're, we're challenged and we're called to work. But he wants us, he, he challenges us here to weigh these things that he tells us. To weigh them. To process them in our minds. Verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Watch. We're challenged to weigh. We're challenged to weigh the seriousness of what he's telling us. Jesus makes these verses very personal to me. And, and yeah, he may be talking here to, to Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, the disciples that were with him on the Mount of Olives. But here he speaks to every individual who will ever live. He says, I say unto all, watch. He's calling upon every person who reads these words, every person who will ever read these words, to look at themselves in light of his coming. In other words, what will his coming mean for you? What will Jesus' coming mean to you? If the rapture were to take place today, would you go to meet Jesus in the clouds? It's a question you need to ask yourself. Would you go meet him in the clouds, or would you stay behind to face the Antichrist in the tribulation? Will the second coming of Jesus be a blessing to you, or will it be a, a, a day of doom for you? If you miss the rapture, and if you happen to survive the wrath of God and the hatred of the Antichrist and the horrors of the tribulation, and if you're alive when Jesus returns as king, it will not be a good day for you. Since you rejected him in the day of grace, we live in the day of grace right now. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. But if you reject him, or if we reject him in the day of grace, he will reject you on that day of judgment. He won't come as your savior, but he'll come as your judge. The only hope that you and I have is to come to Christ today to know him as our Savior, to be saved by the grace of God. And if you reject him now, you will not receive him then. And you can look that up in your Bibles in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. Write it down. When you get home, look it up. Lost friend, ready or not, Jesus is coming. Christian, ready or not, Jesus is coming. And I advise you to be ready. Child of God, are you ready? Believer in Christ, are you ready? If Jesus were to return today, would he find you faithfully serving him? Would he find you carrying out his will in the world? Or would he find you skating around the edges, holding hands with the world? Would he find you inactive in the church? Would he find you doing his will or doing as you will? I challenge every believer in this room to look at yourself and your walk with the Lord in the light of his coming. Do you want him to come while you are living the life that you're living right now? You know, what can we take away from all this that Jesus spoke to his disciples in Mark chapter 13? Jesus is coming. Whether we're ready or not. And if you aren't ready, you can be. And if you are ready, then be watching and working and praying because the master is at the door. And I don't know where this message finds you today. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you'd like to be saved, I invite you to come to him today and be saved. The Bible says that today is a day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. 
And if you are saved, but the Lord has shown you that you're not ready for Him to come, you need to come to Him and get that right today. If He's spoken to you on any level and you have a need this morning, as we stand and sing, I invite you to come.